and question and answer session following the presentations. We encourage you to use the chat feature to submit comments or questions during the presentation. Please be sure to submit your chat to all participants. Your chat postings will be addressed and answered during the discussion and question and answer portion of the webinar following the presentations. As noted previously, phone lines will remain open, however they are muted. After the presentations, the operator will open the lines and you will be able to ask your questions using the phone as well. Finally, please stay on the line after the discussion. The operator will be asking polling questions to obtain your feedback about the presentation. So please stay on until the presentation concludes. And now I would like to introduce our speakers. Teresa Edelstein, Vice President of Post Acute Care Policy and Special Initiatives from the New Jersey Hospital Association. Daniel Moles, President of Transition Healthcare Consultants, representing the New Jersey Department of Health, Division of Health Facilities Evaluation and Licensing. Today we have Allison Gibson, who serves as the Assistant Commissioner, along with Corrine Villano, Supervising Healthcare Evaluator, and Jean Granich, Regulatory Officer. We also have joining us today Dr. Andrew Miller, the Medical Director of HQSI, and finally Deborah Hunter, the Assistant Executive Director of Greenwood House. Now I would like to turn the floor over to our first speakers, Teresa and Dan. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you Dinah for the introduction. Um, this session will cover many things and we're going to start out with uh, a review really for all of you on what the Universal Transfer Form is, why it was done, how it was developed and how it has evolved, when and how it was implemented, and maybe most importantly for today, how is it working? The New Jersey Universal Transfer Form is a statewide mandatory use form. The Department of Health has promulgated regulations uh, to guide facilities, all licensed healthcare facilities, in its use. Patient resident transfers between state licensed healthcare facilities and programs is required. And on the chart, you can see the different directions in which patients travel or residents travel between healthcare settings and where the UTF is required. There are also some important exclusions. Emergency department to emergency department transfers do not require the use of the universal transfer form. And that is because under federal regulation, uh, EMTALA guides hospital emergency departments on what information must be shared. The same is true for emergency department transfers to other settings or return to other settings such as a nursing facility. The origin of the UTF uh, goes back many, many years, actually. Uh, there have been many other attempts in our history in New Jersey by provider associations, by the AMDA chapter in New Jersey, uh, by regional providers working co uh, collaboratively just together, and even through the uh, New Jersey Licensing Standards for Nursing Homes, which at one time had an appendix that included a transfer form, but it was not mandated by the regulation. It was simply a suggested form. And over the years, there has been increasing widespread recognition of the need for something more consistent, in fact, universal for all providers to use. Um, the Department of Health has noted over the years many uh, issues with uh, errors related to patient transfer that contributed to complaints and quality of care concerns. The Healthcare Association of New Jersey has developed best practice guidelines, and for example, in the area of medication management. In NJHA's own pressure ulcer collaborative, which was really uh, a collaborative that included all provider associations in the state, we had providers develop forms to use in transferring patients that just focused on skin care, but they quickly realized that in order to provide the best possible care to individuals arriving at their particular doorstep, they really needed much more than just skin care information. 
AMDA has also developed its own transfer form at one time, and Joint Commission has focused quite a bit of attention on medication reconciliation. Back in 2005, or, or five or six actually, um, we developed a task force under Dan Mole's leadership at the Healthcare Association of New Jersey, made up of volunteers to really tackle how could New Jersey develop a universal transfer form that would meet the needs of uh, all providers and maybe most importantly, uh, the patients we serve. It included the Department of Health and JHA and Leading Age Healthcare Association and all of the other organizations you see listed on this slide. It was a very widespread effort and a lot of thought and consultation went into uh, the conversation around how best to develop this transfer form. Some of the advantages of a universal transfer form I think are things that are pretty intuitive to most providers. Uh, having a clear standard really helps everyone. Um, there's no question about what type of information is needed. It's right there for you. Uh, it improves communication between providers. It helps improve the efficiency of the process of sending patients to different settings and receiving patients from other settings. It also has the uh, potential to vastly improve the quality of care at the point of transition. And it also increases patient or resident and family satisfaction with the process. And most recently, added to this list of very important issues is the ability to reduce readmissions because we are all sharing information more effectively, more clearly, more accurately, and more regularly. Uh, our goal in establishing the UTF um, was to have a paper form that everyone could use initially, but also to create a form that was friendly uh, in the electronic environment, either through an electronic health record or some other means. Some of the challenges we faced um, in developing the UTF included things like Will providers really embrace this idea even though everyone agrees something like this is needed? What information is necessary really at the time that you receive a patient in your setting? Um, how are we going to collect timely medication information? What is timely medication information? How do we communicate it? Um, is less really more? Um, is more better? Uh, that was something that we struggled with, and you'll hear more about as Dan talks about the pilot. Um, and we also really had to learn about electronic health records, how they worked, and how the systems interface with each other. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Moles, my colleague, and he will walk you through the rest of the development process. Thank you, Teresa, and good morning, New Jersey. It is a pleasure and a privilege to speak with you today about the testing and then I'll highlight some of the areas on the transfer form itself to assist you as you use that tool. Uh, the first version of the completed transfer form was a two-page document. And being a brand new form, we decided to take it out for a test drive, if you will. And we subjected that form to a phase one trial. It was somewhat unscientific. It was used a, a few times at 10 volunteer facilities in New Jersey. And based upon that initial phase one testing, the task force made some minor improvements to the form. And then we, with the cooperation of the Department of Health uh, and their funding of, uh, of the cost, uh, the department contracted with the research team from Rutgers University to plan and conduct a 6 to 12 month phase 2 study using science based evaluation tools to utilize the two page transfer form throughout the state. And Teresa Edelstein was very helpful in getting the cooperation of five different hospital systems located in the northern, southern, east, and western areas of the state. And through those five hospital systems, we then got the engagement and involvement of 35 additional facilities and programs, including skilled nursing, rehab, assisted living facilities, home care, and other programs. 
through Rutgers University, they provided a research assistant who went on site to each of the participating facilities and programs to educate the staff to follow up on how the tool was being used. At the conclusion of this phase two research, Rutgers generated a very helpful written report. It provided well-organized feedback. It included a evaluation of over 500 uh, universal transfer forms with evaluation tools completed by the sending facilities as well as the receiving facilities. That almost one year study gave us some good news and it gave us some bad news, if you will. Uh, the bad news to the development team that spent three years developing the two-page form was that the universal feedback from the real world was that the form was just too long, it took too much time to complete, and often the level of detail of the information that the form was asking for was simply not available to the facilities and professionals filling it out to send with the resident or patient. The good news, if you will, is that there was universal agreement among all of the professionals and facilities that participated in the phase two trial that the concept of one form, a universal transfer form, was certainly a worthy concept and that the task force should continue with its efforts to complete its assignment. So based upon this real world feedback, the task force went back to work and from that a one page universal transfer form emerged. And now, if you will, I'm going to ask you to actually have the transfer form and the instructions in front of you on your desk. If you can or available to you on a computer screen, it would assist as uh, I go through certain areas of the form to highlight uh, a few sections. In designing the one-page form, the committee worked to try to develop a tool that would be relatively easy to fill out, and that's why you see all the little boxes. So rather than writing words, uh, you just have to check all boxes. And as Teresa mentioned, we hope to develop a tool that would be computer friendly. And it's my understanding at this point in time that a number of electronic health record uh, companies have in fact uh, developed a software that would enable providers to pre-populate a number of the data fields on the form. Now you see these numbers on the slide in front of you, number 5, 6, 8, 8, and 10. Those numbers correspond to the box or data field on the universal transfer form. And in the interest of time, I certainly have no intention of taking you through the entire form, but let's, let me highlight with your cooperation some of these areas. Section 5 addresses the physician's name and phone number. And in accordance with the instructions, that means a physician from the sending facility who has the most knowledge and responsibility for the care at the sending facility for the care of the resident or patient being transferred. If you move across the form to section six, code status, if you know the code status, check it off. By the way, you'll see abbreviations there, DNR, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, DNH, DNI. Anytime you see an abbreviation on the form and you're not quite sure what it may mean, don't hesitate, go right to the instructions. You'll find that the instructions are also numbered. They go in sequence uh, along with the numbers for the data fields on the form, and every abbreviation used on the form is explained in the instructions. I'm going to ask you to move to section eight, reason for transfer. No, where, where are we? Okay, yes, yeah, section eight, thank you, reason for transfer. It's essential that the sending facility highlight in as few words as possible why is this resident or patient being moved from one setting to another. Note also in section eight, we have not only the traditional four vital signs, but we've included pain as a fifth vital sign. And note further that next to the word pain, 
there's a box that says none. So we not only want you to document, please, information about pain, but if in fact the patient or resident has no pain, please indicate none. Moving, if you would, now to section 10, restraints. If you check off, again, check off no or yes, we want an affirmative answer there. And if restraints are needed, in accordance with the instructions, explain somewhere in section 8 why this patient requires the restraints. Section 15 focuses on the skin condition. And again, I just want to draw you to your attention to the box that says no wounds. If there are no wounds of any type, we feel it's important to check that off. Uh, not only, again, for continuity of care, but reasons of, of, of potential liability for both the sending and the receiving facility. Section 18 is somewhat self-explanatory. It deals with the importance of protecting and documenting any personal effects that were set with the resident or patient at the time of transfer. Section 19, I'll mention it briefly. Others presenting today will perhaps like to go into more detail about the use of Section 19, but it's intended, again, to make it relatively easy to complete your responsibilities uh, by checking off relevant forms that you're going to copy and attach to this tool. However, please note that you must attach information that details the resident or patient's current medications as well as the last dose received. Uh, moving to section 20, the at-risk alerts. Again, you'll see there's a box for none. So if there are no such alerts, please check off none. If there are such alerts, please be sure to include them. Also, you'll see in section 20, there's an area for weight-bearing status, which is self-explanatory, but there is a box on the weight-bearing status that says none. And if you're not sure what that means, again, if you refer to the instructions, it would explain to you that that means, in effect, that the resident or patient is uh, either has no weight-bearing ability uh, for whatever possible reasons. Uh, section 20. One is the mental status of the patient. If the reason for transfer includes a change in the mental status, in accordance with the instructions, that ought to have been mentioned or explained in section eight. And down the bottom of the page, you see section 26. That asks that the facility sending the resident or patient enter the name and the title and the unit, if you will, and the phone number of the person completing the form and the phone number to whom the person to whom the receiving facility can call upon receipt of the patient with the transfer form if they have any, any particular uh, questions. If we move to the next slide, this slide, in my opinion, is a keeper. This is one you want to hold on to and have available to you. It has the uh, accurate uh, URLs, internet addresses, if you will, where you can find the UTF form as a PDF, as a Word document. All of the instructions, well, it's a two-page instruction form, is there. Uh, the Department of Health has a very helpful web website that includes over 85 questions and the answers to eight, over 85 questions about the UTF. And lastly, about a year ago, Provider Magazine published an article about New Jersey's efforts to develop and implement the universal transfer form, and I've given you the link to that article. Lastly, if you have any compliments or concerns or suggestions or feedback regarding your use of the transfer form, again, positive, negative, or, uh, or whatever, uh, or even problems with perhaps receiving uh, residents or patients without the transfer form, don't hesitate to uh, contact your association representatives and specifically Loretta at the Healthcare Association of New Jersey uh, and or Teresa at the Hospital Association. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Teresa and Dan. I would now like to introduce our representatives from the New Jersey Department of Health, Allison Gibson, Corrine Villano, and Jean Brenich. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to say before I start that when I first came into this project, which was very late in the day, as far as I was concerned, the form was actually almost four pages long and had many, many more boxes and many, many more lines. And I really want to congratulate the group who did all the work on it to bring this down to a comprehensive, focused, and extremely useful form. It is something that I've actually shared with my colleagues in virtually every other state in the country, and they were extremely grateful for it. Um, over the years, I think one of the, the significant things that has happened is that we've come to an understanding of the critical aspect of um, a care transition in the life of a patient or a resident and the relationship of that event to safety and quality issues in care. Um, for the first year, the department approached the use of this form in a, in a true spirit of education. We, pre we supported and helped present several um, educational offer offerings and have responded to questions from individual facilities. Um, now we consider that facilities have had adequate time to incorporate the use of this mode of communication into their care processes. The department considers the use of the universal transfer form to be as essential to the care and safety of patients and residents as all other regulatory assessment and communication requirements, such as the use of a physician's history and physical or nursing assessment. Uh, we, in terms of survey activities related to this, we anticipate that any department assessment of the use of the form will primarily be in response to concerns or complaints from the receiving facility. We would investigate this as with any other care-related complaint. In addition, when we review records related to other types of complaints, we will incorporate our um, review of the universal transfer form as indicated in our documentation review. And as with all surveys and investigations, if we identify deficient practices, we will generate enforcement actions appropriate to finding. Enforcement actions aside, I would just like to repeat, I think this is one of the most valuable forms that we have developed. I'm fully behind the fact that the department incorporated this into regulation, and as I say, we are uh, considered um, an example to many, many other states. And I'd like to pass now the um, discussion on to Kareem Villano. Thank you, Allison, <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. Uh, we have uh, included here the top 20 frequently asked questions. Uh, also, there's the website that was shown on uh, page 16, uh, but we're, we've picked out the top 20 FAQ questions, which we're going to review today. Uh, first one is, which providers are required to use the universal transfer form? And the answer is, all healthcare providers that are licensed by the Department of Health are required to use the universal transfer form. The next question is, who fills out the universal transfer form? Does it have to be a registered nurse? And the answer to that is no. There are some instances where a nurse is not always going to be available in the facility or in the resident's home when the person is being transferred. And as always, if more information is needed, the receiving facility can always follow up with the sending facility. Next slide. Um, question is, will the universal transfer form requirement be extended to other licensed healthcare facilities, and that would be specifically um, healthcare service firms and nurse registries, which are under the Department of Law and Public Safety Division of Consumer Affairs, also referred to as DCA. And the answer to that is the DOH, the Department of Health, cannot extend the UTF to these other entities because they don't fall under our authority. That is, they're not licensed by the Department of Health. Uh, it would take an action by the DCA to have the universal transfer form extended to nurse registries and healthcare service firms. The next slide, the question is, where can we obtain copies of the universal transfer form? And the answer to that is, interactive copies of the universal transfer form are available on the Department 
Department of Health's website, which you can find uh, that website on slide 16. You can get, you can download, uh, you know, you, a copy if you choose to go to a carbon copy or any other type of universal transfer form. Then the facility must have copies made on its own. The next question is, how can I find out if a healthcare provider is licensed by the New Jersey Department of Health? And the answer to that is you can perform a search for licensed healthcare facilities and providers on the department's website at the address shown on this slide. If a patient is discharged and case management has made a follow-up physician appointment, do we need to send a universal transfer form? Well, if the physician's appointment is at a licensed healthcare facility, such as an ambulatory care facility, then yes, the universal transfer form is required. If the appointment was made to the, the physician's private practice office, then the universal transfer form would not be required because that private office is not licensed by the Department of Health. My facility received a patient who came in with a universal transfer form. Can I just copy and write no change? And the answer is no, you would still need to complete a new UTF with the information that you have. The next slide uh, has a question, why is there no place for insurance information on the universal transfer form? And that's because information, insurance information isn't really relevant to the patient care aspect. Often a copy of the face sheet will be attached to the universal transfer form, and that usually has the patient's insurance information. So if you can add the face sheet or include the insurance information on the you can add the face sheet and include the insurance information on another attachment if you so desire. Has a template been developed for policies and procedures as required by New Jersey Administrative Code? No, there is no template because the department does not develop policies and procedures. And the next question is, the expectation is to complete the universal transfer form to the best of our ability. At a minimum, what needs to be filled in? And the answer to that is the information that the facility must include on the universal transfer form is the information requested on the UTF that the facility has available at the time of transfer. That's the first 10 questions, and the next 10, for the next 10 questions, I'm going to turn over to Jean Brennich. Uh, thanks, Karine. Um, one of the questions we get a lot of is, you know, particularly as electronic records are expanding, is changing the numbering. And the answer is no. The idea is, you know, everything needs to be numbered exactly as it is on the HFBL 7, because the idea is for this form to be truly universal. If facilities are used to going to number 17, for example, is IV access. It's got to be number 17, regardless of how you're uh, printing this out or doing it electronically. Uh, we've received questions on pre-populating the UTF, and this, this actually came up during the development, which is why you see a signature line on the UTF for you know, whoever pre-populates the form. So you can put down the info that's not changing names, stuff like that, and not have to be filling that out when you're arranging the transfer. Uh, one of the questions is people are like, well, I can print out an attachment. Can I just write C attached for this number? And the answer is no. If it's a box on the UTF, if it's a section on the UTF, it needs to be completed on the form. If you have any other useful information, you can include that as an attachment. Uh, still dealing with attachments, what do you need to attach uh, for Section 19? Uh, the answer is if you have it, you need to attach it. 
Uh, again, dealing with Section 19, one of the questions is, well, this patient's been here for two years, what do I need to send? Uh, the idea is send what's relevant to their current condition. So the example we use in the FAQ is if labs are run regularly, you know, you're not going to send two years worth of labs. What you're going to send is, you know, send the last result because that will give them an idea of where they were on that date as to where they are now when they're running labs. Uh, we get the question, okay, we dial 911, the paramedics are here, they're ready to take them away, we haven't completed the form yet. Send them. Don't, don't make the paramedics wait. Um, you know, send what you have, if you pre-populated it, whatever you can complete, do it, and then follow up with the hospital uh, later, you know, once the uh, resident or patient leaves the building. Medication information gets asked a lot. What needs to be included? We're looking for a copy of the MAR, the medication administration record, with the last dose. If your facility does medication reconciliation, uh, attach that as well. Again, you need to send what you have, not if the form asked for it. If it's not something the facility has, you don't need to go. Try and create it just to fill the UTS out. Uh, again, as we move to electronic records, uh, does it need to be identical? Uh, the answer is no. What we're looking for is, and you know, we're using the term substantially similar. Uh, if it's in the upper left-hand corner, put it in the upper left-hand corner of the electronic version when you're looking at it or when you're printing it out. It doesn't need to be, you know, an inch and a half over or two inches down. But the idea is, again, to have this firm form be truly universal. So if you're used to looking in one place for the information you're looking for, you want it on your electronic version to be roughly in the same spot. And again, we highlight the fact that keep the numbering identical to the form. I uh, get the question, well, we've, we've done it electronically, and the way we've got it printed out is it's going to two or three pages, and the answer to that is, is no. You know, to keep it to one form. The, the idea is, again, this started as a four-pager, one to a two-pager. We got it down to one with attachments. Uh, it, you know, and electronic records comes up a lot in these because most of the questions are directed towards them. We want to add items. This, this is important to our facility. Can we put it in there somewhere on the form? Uh, and the answer is no. You know, keep the items on that one page or what's on the HFBL 7. Uh, the idea is, you know, if it's relevant to you, if you believe it's relevant to the patient, include that as an attachment to the form. And that's the end of the FAQs, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more questions at the end of the seminar. Thank you, Allison, Jean, and Kareem. I will now be turning the floor over to Dr. Andrew Miller. Thank you, Diana. Uh, I was asked to talk about how the uh, universal transfer form fits into the context of transitions of care in general. As Teresa mentioned, improving care transitions is one of the goals of the, the universal transfer form. There's been a lot of attention over the last few years on the need to improve transitions of care as patients move between different healthcare settings. The Affordable Care Act, the health care reform law, includes a number of provisions that address transitions of care for Medicare beneficiaries, including most famously a penalty for hospitals with excessive readmission rates. All but two uh, New Jersey hospitals are losing up to 1% of their Medicare uh, reimbursement as of October 1st of 2012 because their readmission rates are higher than the national average. And other insurers are also trying to reduce hospital readmissions. Um, so a lot of attention has been focused on improving transitions of care in order to keep patients from returning to the hospital. Uh, but uh, hospital readmissions are not only a hospital problem. They involve the whole healthcare community. It's important to have effective communication and coordination among providers in the community. Because once a patient leaves the hospital, these providers have a key role in keeping patients out of the hospital. In fact, um, good transitions uh, between providers anywhere in the healthcare system are important, particularly for patients with complex problems. So for example, a patient who is being sent home from a skilled nursing facility um, who will be receiving care um, 
Sure. Uh, who will be receiving care from a home uh, health agency or a patient with end-stage renal disease who's being discharged from the hospital who will be continuing to receive dialysis um, or an individual who lives in an assisted living facility who's being admitted to the hospital. These are all patients for whom good transitions care are very important um, in preventing um, deterioration of their health. I didn't list physician offices as an example because only licensed healthcare facilities are required to use the UTF, um, as Corrine mentioned. Um, but transfers involving physician offices are also very important. So, for example, a patient um, who is referred by his primary care physician to a cardiologist, transferring key information about that patient um, is, is just as important. Now, unfortunately, um, there's no one magic bullet uh, to assure good transitions of care. There are many different things um, that can make a difference. Um, however, almost every intervention benefits from effective, timely, and or complete communication uh, between providers. And so transitions of care need to include, for example, having effective processes in place for smooth um, handovers, um, and I, it says uh, discharges and, and transfers here, um, um, but we wanted to, to, to emphasize that um, when a patient is being uh, moved from one uh, facility or entity to another, it's important uh, not to think of this as no longer our responsibility, but we're handing over this patient so that the next provider of care uh, can provide the best care possible for that patient. Uh, and that those processes need to be able to, well, number one, identify who are the patients who are at high risk and address those needs in the information that's shared, uh, to address medication reconciliation, a number of other things that are, that are captured on the universal transfer form also. Uh, reliable systems for sharing key information are very important. This is one thing that the UTF is designed uh, specifically to do. Uh, effective patient and caregiver education is very important um, and involving uh, patients and caregivers in, in the management of their uh, chronic, the patient's chronic illness uh, is very key. Uh, even if a patient sees a doctor once every week, that means there's six other days a week where their chronic illness um, is, is still there, and if they're not fully involved in, in managing it as well as possible, they're not going to be able to remain as healthy as possible. So patients and, and caregivers need to be part of the, of the team providing care. Um, and for patients who are going home, as opposed to a nursing facility or an assisted living facility, availability of appropriate community services um, is very important so that uh, patients' needs are met. Now, one thing that's uh, not uh, mentioned, well, it is uh, indirectly mentioned on the uh, uh, UTF is end-of-life care options. Um, they are not, um, end-of-life care is not primarily focused on improving transitions of care. However, end-of-life care choices such as palliative care or hospice um, are important ways to prevent unwanted readmissions. The New Jersey Uni Universal Transfer Form allows you to, uh, to indicate a patient's wishes for end-of-life care. Um, uh, under uh, item 19, um, you can indicate if a patient has an advanced directive or not. And if, that's, uh, if that box is checked, uh, that should be attached. Um, New Jersey uh, recently um, made available a, uh, the POLST form, which stands for Practitioner's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And that is medical orders that follow the patient uh, no matter where they are, uh, whether they're in a hospital or a nursing facility, um, uh, leaving home care uh, at home, going to a doctor's office. Um, the POLST form was just made available on February 22nd. It's available on the New Jersey Hospital Association website and I believe the Department of Health website. Um, the POLST form is designed to stay with the patient, but you can indicate on the universal transfer form uh, if a patient has a POLST form signed uh, by uh, checking either advanced directives or other on item 19, and you could attach a copy of the POLST form. Um, the key thing here is for the receiving uh, provider to know that the patient has uh, made these uh, choices and, and that information is available. 
Um, so just to wrap up, the universal transfer form is designed to provide a standard, reliable process to transfer key information in a timely manner. Um, uh, but that only works if it's used consistently and if it's completed accurately, uh, including having uh, the appropriate attached information. I'd now like to uh, turn uh, this over to uh, Debbie Hunter, uh, who will talk about uh, how uh, her facility has has used and, and has used the universal transfer form. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. And I got to tell you, I'm feeling awfully important being able to speak with this group of folks. But I'm also just the assistant administrator of a nursing facility. I don't generally have to fill out a transfer form. So I'm going to give you a success story. I'm going to talk to you about what our nurses had to say about this form, the people that actually fill it out. It was a consensus in my facility that this is a great form. I had only positive comments. Now, i got to tell you, I didn't expect that. I expected to hear, ugh, it's another piece of paper. We got too much to do. We don't need this. That's not the comments that I got. They said that the form was quicker. The form prompts. It's fairly all-inclusive. Now, if you'll remember when Teresa was speaking on slide number nine, it's a really important slide because I was kind of learning from this um, webinar as well. This is a communication between providers. And what our nurses found was this is a checklist. You don't have to write stuff out. With the exception of the demographics and number eight, it's really just a checklist. It prompts your memory of what you need to send. And when you get down to number 19, again, it's a prompt. What do I need to send with this resident? Now, this is the sending piece because I have two perspectives here. It's an easier form, and one of the things that I've heard several times from people here today is this is all on one page. There's no back to front, and I had several nurses that that was their most favorite thing about this form. It's one page. It's all there. I don't have to turn it over. All right, that's the sending end. Now I'm going to talk to you about when we receive the form. The first thing they look at is skin condition. They want to know if this patient has wounds, if they have a rash, if they have a decubitus. You've got to remember you've got an MDS to fill out. I don't want to own a decubitus if I don't have to. So they're going to look for this stuff. Weight bear status, very, very important. If you get a new transfer and this patient wants to go to the bathroom, what's their weight bear status? Can I take them to the bathroom? All right, here's one that really surprised me. They loved the immunization screening. That's number 24. I would never have picked that in a million years. Do I have to give a PPD? Have they had their pneumonia? What do I have to do for this patient? That, that, was, that, that was a biggie with a lot of the nurses. Now, I work in a Jewish facility. I have a lot of people that speak Russian, they speak Polish, and they speak Yiddish. They go right to language ability. They found that that was very, very important, especially if it's somebody that they don't know. Now, the obvious choices, their eye goes right to, do they have an IV? Do they have oxygen? Do they have NEB? And what's their diet? Can I feed this patient if they ask for a glass of water, or are they a tube feed? All right, those were the obvious areas. Now, another part that was really important, and this was important not only to the nurses, but this is important to the resident and the family as well. Do they have glasses? Do they have dentures? All right. Do they have a hearing aid? Do you know how expensive this stuff is to replace? So the nurses, they go right for that. And you've got a really comprehensive form here. Now, I want to tell you that I had a patient the other day who went out of our facility with an MI. On the transfer form, the nurse in number eight, this is what she wrote. She wrote, patient complaining of chest pain, nitroglycerin given, the time it was given, no relief, a set of vital signs. She put second nitro given, the time, 
no relief, a set of vital signs, and then physician directed transfer to hospital. When that patient gets to the emergency room, now she had filled out the entire form. When that patient gets to the emergency room, he's got a good start, a good knowledge base on whether we should have given roll aids or done an EKG. So I, I have found that the universal transfer form, it's mandatory, so get used to it. It's a good form and it's a good way to communicate. Thank you, Deb. I really appreciate your success stories and all the work that your staff do. And thank you to all our presenters. Please do note the contact information. At this time, we will begin the discussion and question and answer portion of the webinar. I would like to ask Stacy to open up the lines. And if she can provide the instructions on how to do that, we would appreciate that. While we do wait for the questions to come in via the telephone, we will be addressing some of the questions we've received in the chat portion. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you have any questions, please press the number one key on your phone. Again, if there are any questions at this time, please press the number one key on your phone. Thank you, Stacy. We will start with the first chat question that we received from Patricia Shambon. When a facility has electronic access to the clinical record and prefer to access the clinical information using this method, would this meet the standard? And part two of that question is, would the UTF form also need to be completed? You still need to use the UTF. Uh, you know, you, we, the form was developed so you had critical information in one spot and you knew where to look for it. So facilities, even if they're, you know, under different licenses who are sharing an electronic medical record system are, you know, still required to develop an electronic version of the UTF so you can go right to the information that's on the form. Thank you, Jean. Stacy, is anybody on the line? Yes, ma'am. Our first question will come from Yusuf Ferris with Multi Kidney Clinic. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is, is um, if a UTF is required for every time the patient goes out the hospital and back to dialysis, or if it's just upon the first admission to dialysis? Uh, again, if it's if it's a readmit and you know the person went to the hospital for a reason for a change in condition, a uh, new UTF should be done for a change in condition. If there's if there's no change in condition, uh, it's not required. If they're just returning to the dialysis center, they want to. Mm -hmm. But again, if something changes in the hospital, the dialysis center should be aware of a new UTF should go. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's proceed on to the next chat question. Um, this is from Brazil Hernandez. Sorry about that. Her question is about question number six on the UTF, the code status. There is no box for a full code, and our staff is either leaving blank or writing NA. I looked at the instructions for completion, and there is no instructions about what to do if there is full code. So our question is, what is the expectation of the state when answering the question if patient is full code? A blank NA or write full code? Uh, you just wouldn't check one of the boxes. You'd leave it blank. You know, the, the, the code status there would be inherent then that there are full code. There are no other instructions. You're supposed to do everything, you know, during the code that you should be doing for that patient then. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, related to that, you'll see in box number 19, uh, there's a box to check off code status. So if your facility or program has a, a, a one-page document, perhaps, on which you record the patient's uh, code preference, there's no reason why you can't copy that document, check that box in section 19 and include that with the information. Thank you. Um, Stacy. do we have any other phone questions? 
Yes, ma'am. We have a ne uh, our next question comes from Ellen Angelo with Ocean Medical Center. Please go ahead. Hi, I just have a question from our maternity department. If they're transferring um, new babies out to another higher level acute care facility, is it required to do the universal transfer form? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll address another question from the chat. This is from Barb Grande. We currently developed an electronic form utilizing the data point provided and numbered the same way. Does this meet the standard? Currently, we print out the form and send to the receiving facility or home care organization. Well, again, uh, you know, when we went over the FAQs, it was the form needs to be substantially similar when you point it, you know, when you print it out to send to the other facility. So, you know, the item should be again roughly in the same spot on the printout as they are in the form provided by the department. Thank you, Stacy. Are there any other phone questions? Yes, ma'am. Our next question comes from Janet Bedoya with St. Re Joseph's Regional Medical Center. Please go ahead. I have the question. Of, hello? Hello, we can hear you. Okay, I, I have the question about the dialysis. Our interpretation was that all dialysis patients, when they leave the hospital, needed the form. Uh, so I'm a little confused on what they indicated because, I mean... You, you, you always need to use the form when you're making arrangements for dialysis. Uh, I, I believe the question was the patients returning to dialysis that was already established. So if there's not a change, then you know the form's not really required. But if you're in the hospital, you're making the arrangements for the patient to receive outpatient dialysis, and this is the first time they're receiving dialysis, yes, you need to use the form. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So this was perfect timing because we have a somewhat follow-up question on dialysis um, use and the UTF. The question from the chat is from Nicole Damiano. Is the UTF necessary for transfers back and forth to a dialysis facility that usually occurs three times a week? No, if you look at the FAQs, that's addressed. If, if you're a nursing facility and you're sending someone out for outpatient dialysis three times a week, you, you would send the form with the resident the first time they go. And again, it's just like the, the hospital issue. If there's some sort of change of condition that the dialysis center needs to be made aware of, then you would send the form, uh, again, indicating, you know, highlighting that change in condition. But for regular dialysis, uh, you would not need to send the form three times a week. And if I could add, this is Corrine, uh, Jean, if I could add one thing to that, um, if you've got a patient who's going back and forth three times a week from your facility to a dialysis, you should already have a mechanism in place to communicate with the dialysis, dialysis facility, for example, what meds they got, when was the last time they got them, you know, anything, anything new or changing, you should have a mechanism already in place so you wouldn't need the uh, UTF for that. Thank you. Stacy. are there any other phone questions? Yes, ma'am. Our next question comes from Suzette with JF Health, JFK Health System. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, I work in a hospice program that actually has um, an inpatient unit for symptom management or end of life. If it's within the same program, do we have to fill out the universal transfer form if the patient's going from the home setting into our inpatient unit for symptom management or end of life? Yeah, again, the issue depends, is it the same license? Yeah, so if it's, they're receiving hospice care in the home and then they're receiving hospice care in the inpatient facility? Yes, it's under the same license. It's, and, it's no. basically the, okay. Yeah, you don't need to use the UTF, so that. So do not, correct? Well, it's not required. It, you know, it might make sense, but we're only requiring it for transfer between different licenses. Okay, so you're staying you. under the same license. So that, that also assumes, again, that to Corrine's point earlier on dialysis and nursing home, that you have a communication mechanism for how you're telling the inpatient unit about the needs of that individual. If you don't
don't have another mechanism, then the UTF would be a perfect mechanism. But if you have one, there's no need to use the UTF. Thank you very much. If we can go and look at another chat box question, this is from Grizel Hernandez again, and her question is about number 22, the pre-admission screening and resident review. Um, the instructions read, check off box if level one has been completed. If this question does not apply for a patient, i.e. a child, what is the expectation of the state? Leave it blank, write in not available, etc. You just wouldn't check the box off if it's not required. You know, it, it's an indication that so the facility receiving the patient doesn't need to do the pass R again if there's already one done. Thank you. Stacy, are there more phone questions? Yes, ma'am. Our next question comes from Carol Pippi with Trinitas Regional Medical Center. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is John Lanier, not Carol Pepe. Uh, just, I have a question about outcomes related to the project with the UTF and what kind of outcomes you're anticipating and how those are being measured. Uh, you know, typically on the department's end, uh, there, you know, this was all done on the front end on what would be useful as far as follow-ups. We haven't done any at this point in time. Um, this is Teresa. We, um, we are actually working with the Department of Health to see if we can um, do some evaluative, um, I'll use the term loosely, research um, to see what, what impact uh, the UTF may be having on helping hospitals and other healthcare organizations reduce readmissions and also improve um, end-of-life care and other aspects of patient care based on the information that's being shared. Um, we're, we're trying to find a way to fund that evaluation. That's, that's really our, our challenge right now, but it is being considered. Thank you. So you're, Go looking, ahead. so you're looking for potential outcomes, and when you start looking at that, will that roll out to the organizations that are using it so we can start looking at the data as well? Yes, that's the intention. Same manner? Yes, that's the intention. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. This is Dinah from HQSI. We will take a brief polling question now. So, Stacy, if we could do those, and then we'll return to the questions and answers because we do have lots of questions. Stacy, if you could proceed with the polling questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin our polling session. Please respond to the following by pressing 1 for yes and 2 for no. My knowledge about the universal transfer form increased based on this presentation. Again, press 1 for yes and 2 for no. Next question, again, please respond by pressing one for yes and two for no. I plan to share key points of this presentation with others at my organization. Press one for yes and two for no. is now closed for this question. Our next question, again, please press 1 for yes and 2 for no. Overall, I was satisfied with the session. Press 1 for yes and 2 for no.
session is now closed. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy, are there any other questions in the phone line? We will return to questions. Just let me change back to that screen. I apologize. That's okay. Thank you, Stacy. Our next question, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, press the number one key on your phone. Our next question will come from Vincent with JL, um, I'm sorry, John Montgomery. Uh, John L. Montgomery. Yes, good morning. This is Maureen Cole Parker, and I'm calling from John L. Montgomery with Monmouth County Care Centers. And we had a question regarding the form. The previous form, we wanted to know what was omitted from that form. We, without going in great detail, can you kind of highlight what areas were omitted from that other form? We noticed possibly the pass on level was not included in that previous form. Can you please clarify that information for us? You know, I, I don't think any of us right now is prepared to discuss what was what was done on the form previously. Uh, you know, that's not what's presented to us right now. The issue in front of us is, you know, using the form as developed. Yeah, if, if you'd like, this is Teresa, if you'd like to email me your question, um, I'd be happy to dig out the two-page form and go over it with you to give you a sense of what we took away. I'd be happy to do that separately. Yes, thank you. Uh, but please, you know, please take comfort in knowing that the task force was comfortable uh, and confident that the information uh, necessary and appropriate at the time of transition uh, can be captured on the one-page form uh, if the instructions are followed properly. If I may add one, this is Alison, if I may add one comment, but that was the stage that I actually entered the process, and I think what I heard from people at the time was many different facility types wanted material that was really specific to their type of client or, or their type of care. Uh, and had we included everything from all the different facility types, say things that would be much more necessary in pediatrics than we were in uh, gerontology, then that's what was expanding the form to an unmanageable size. Thank you for all the responses. We will now look at another chat question. This is from Patricia um, Chambon. If the patient has an appointment with one of the hospital clinics that has access to the clinical record, would the clinical documents be required if they will be accessing the electronic medical record? Uh, again, uh, the answer is if it's another licensed facility, if that outpatient facility is licensed separately from the hospital, you need to use the UTF even if access to the EMR is available. You know, and uh, if, you, you know, if you're doing it electronically, then, you, you know, you should, you know, so we could have the front page developed electronically with all the attachments that you can pull off the EMR. Thank you. Stacy. are there additional phone questions? Yes, ma'am. Our next question will come from Andrea with St. Barnabas Behavioral Health. Please go ahead. Good morning. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on question five. We're licensed by the Department of Health and we're a psychiatric facility and we often send patients to state facilities and fill out their required form by the Division of Mental Health. Are we also required to use this universal transfer form when sending to a state facility? Uh, no, because if, if the state facility is licensed by uh, Human Services, you would not be required to use the form. Uh, unless, I, I am aware at one point they were discussing making the UTF one of the required documents to send. But I'm not quite sure where that ended. Um, actually, Teresa, I, I think um, I'm going to need to go back and look at that with uh, Mary Dietrich in our office because on the Department of uh, Human Services website for the Division of Mental Health, um, they do have the UTF in addition to their own form uh, as part of the package uh, for 
transfer of patients, so I just want to clarify whether they're expecting both or not. I'll have to get back to you. Um, so if we can just note her name, I will get back to her. Thank you. We have another chat question. Um, this is from Grizel. Um, do you have any resources for staff education? Well, we, we've, we've done you know, seminars throughout the state. We've done, this is at least the third webinar that the members of this group have been involved with. I believe the uh, Hospital Association has information available on their website that uh, Teresa can direct you. Yeah, we, ha we have a recorded webinar from uh, November of 2011 um, that is meant to be uh, good for people who are new to the UTF. It's very detailed. So if you want to contact me, I can direct you to how to get to that recorded webinar. Thank you. Um, we do have another question from the chat. Um, the question is from Emily uh, Turnier. Um, when will we be able to make this form electronic? Well, that, that's up to the facility to do. The, you know, the department has adopted the form and, you know, that one-page form with the instructions is in the regulations and it's, it's required. Uh, you know, I know numerous facilities have gone through different providers to do an electronic version of the UTF. Thank you. Stacy. do we have any more um, film questions? Yes, ma'am. We have a question coming from Carol No with Holy Redeemer. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. We're just wondering how we can download um, this PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on the HQSI website, and we will notify the registrants for this event when it's posted. Okay, thank you. Stacy, do we have any more phone questions? Yes, ma'am. We have a question coming from Mary O'Hara uh, with Harrogate. Please go ahead. Mary, Mary, your line is live. Please ask your question. Uh, I did not have a question. Stacey, if there is another question in the phone line, can you proceed to the next one? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. We have a question coming from Jasmine Lopez with Hackensack University Medical Center. I will, because there's other, other uh, Joanne Coelho. I think she has some, Joanne, yeah, that's it. She had some questions that she wanted to look at. The Jasmine, time. your line is live. Please ask your question. So I'm going to write them down and, and see if I can have some time later on today or tomorrow to go through the data. Stacey, if you can proceed to the next um, phone question. Yes, ma'am. Our next question is from Patricia Johnson with the Vita Hackensack. Please go ahead. Yes, what I'm calling about is when is the dialysis facility required to use the UTF? Transferring patients to another facility, um, a hospital admission, or for EMTs? Is there anything else besides that, or am I off base? But whenever you're making arrangements to transfer the patient, though, those are definitely circumstances you would be using the UTF. Thank you. Thank you. We will take um, another comment and question from the chat. Um, we do thank Vincent um, for his comments about the UTF, highlighting um, that 26 should be number 27 on slide 15, so we'll certainly take a look at that. Um, and a question from Maria Green. Um, I work for a home care agency. Is a current med list to be sent with the UTF. We spend, we send patients from home to ED via 911. Uh, the information, if, if the information is available at the time of transfer, you would send it at the time of transfer. If it's something where, you know, the your, your patient is at home alone and is dialing 911, you could have what's pre-populated there and you could contact the hospital later to see what sort of information they could require. Thank you. Um, Stacy. if we have another phone question, can we address that? Yes, ma'am. Our next question comes from Yosef Ferris with Nolly Kenny Clinic. Please go ahead. Um, my question is, um, what can you do if, um, 
If a patient is coming from the hospital for the first time and the social worker does not send the universal transfer form along with the patient records? Uh, what you should do is you should call the hospital and ask for the UTF. Uh, if, if they're not being compliant and you know they're not following up with the form, what you would do is you would you could call our complaints hotline, and then someone from the department would reach out to the hospital and inform them of the requirement to use the form. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to address a question from the chat now. This is from Yisrael Grossman. Um, the question is, what date do we have to start implementing the UTF? Uh, several years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stacy, if we could please um, take another phone question. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please press the number one key on your phone. We have a follow-up question coming from Yusuf. Please go ahead. Yeah, the other question is, um, if a patient is being discharged from the hospital into a nursing home, um, and then they're scheduled to come into dialysis, who do we get the universal transfer from, the hospital or the nursing home? Uh, it would be whoever's making the arrangements for the dialysis. So if the hospital is discharging to the nursing home and at the same time making the arrangements, they would, the hospital would be sending you the UTF. Now, if they're being discharged to the nursing home and the nursing home is making the arrangements, the nursing home would be sending you the UTF. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, if we could take another question from the chat now. Our sending ER MD wants three days of nursing notes sent with the UTF. What is your thought on this practice? You know, it's not addressed with the regulations, and it's, it's probably a good thing to send. Thank you. If I could just add to that, perhaps if you have a specific set of nursing homes that, that uh, transfer people to you regularly, then um, communicating with those nursing homes and having those discussions about what will really help your ED function the way it functions, the, the best way, then sort of reaching out to the administrator would be a, a very valuable thing to do. Thank you. Stacy. do we have any phone line questions? Yes, ma'am, we have a question coming from Margie at Paragon Village. Please go ahead. Margie, your line is live. Please ask your question. Stacy, yeah, if you can move on to the next question. Our next question is from Mary Peterson with Holy Redeemer. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Debbie. Um, if our rehab department is suggesting outpatient um, therapy and that therapy uh, is, is licensed, who's responsible? We would not be making the uh, arrangements, so who's responsible for sending them the UTF? Uh, you're responsible to send the form if you're making the arrangements. So would the doctor be responsible to send the form? The doctor would not send the UTF because the doctor's office isn't required to use it. Okay, thank you. Then then it, if we're not making the arrangements, then the form would not be sent if they're no, a home the, care patient. No, the, the form would not be sent. Thank you. Um, another question from the chat from Maria Green. When or how should the home care agency receive the UTF? We usually get fax referrals prior to patient leaving hospital or skilled nursing facility. Should they become part of the permanent patient chart since it is a DOH requirement? Yes, it is part of the chart. You know, it becomes part of the chart for the home health agencies. And you should be receiving it at the time the hospital is making the arrangements. Thank you. Stacy, do we have an additional phone line question? There is no one in queue. Okay, we do have more chat questions, so we will continue with some of those. The next question is from Lena Eshaw. Does the UTF form need to be sent to both the skilled nursing facility and the dialysis unit when a patient is discharged from the hospital? Uh, yes, if the hospital is making the arrangements, the hospital will be sending the UTF to both. Thank you. 
Um, another question is from Patricia Shambone. Could you please readdress my question? Um, we'll scroll back up um, to find that if needed. Um, the notes here are for those accessing agencies pulling their clinical info from the electronic record and we send the UTF, the question is, do we still need all the documents also? Uh, if, if the attachments are available off the electronic medical records, no. I hope that addresses your question, Patricia. Um, if you do have further questions, I'm sure we can um, facilitate uh, email questions later on. Um, we'll continue to another chat question here from Jamie Bradley. Um, what can you do in the case a, a social worker does not send a UTF upon discharge of a patient being admitted to dialysis for the first time? Uh, again, you would reach out to the facility. Uh, the facility is unresponsive, and you would reach out to the uh, department's complaints program for assistance. Thank you. Stacy. do we have any additional phone questions? Yes, ma'am. We have a question coming from Carol Culkins with Hackensack University Medical Center. Please go ahead. Oh, I, was, I did this for Pat Chambon. She had a question concerning the universal transfer form and the electronic record. I don't think she's here. She's not in my office anymore. I'm sorry. Okay, we did um, address some of our questions from the chat, um, but uh, if she does have uh, further questions, um, she can reach out to the uh, presenters as listed on the presenter slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we'll move on to another question in the um, chat queue here. It's from Cynthia Robotti. Um, home care. How do we handle a UTF not completed? For example, not signed. Do we fax back? And what is the timeline for expecting it to be returned? Many healthcare facilities are under the impression to send the transfer form home with the patients, which is not a good practice since forms are getting lost. No, I, again, you should be receiving the form when they're making the arrangements uh, for your home health agency to provide services. Uh, if the form's incomplete or not sent uh, and you contact them, they, they should really be providing you with the information you know, as soon as possible. Again, if, and if you have issues with that, if it's a repeated practice, uh, you, know, you would reach out to the department's complaint number. And they, this is Teresa, Cindy, Cindy, they should not be sending it home with the patient. The patient isn't a licensed healthcare entity. <laughs> the home health agency is the licensed healthcare entity. I mean, I mean I, I'm not trying to be glib, but maybe they need to be reminded that uh, it, this is a communication tool between licensed healthcare entities, and that's why you need it. Thank you. Stacy. do we have any additional phone line questions? Yes, ma'am, we have a question coming from Victoria Welch with Deborah Hart and Long. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Our question is, or question is related to your question number 21. If, if there is not really an answer, if the patient come from, comes from an ECF to the hospital not as an inpatient, not admitted for an X-ray, is the hospital required to do the UTF when the resident returns to the extended care facility? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? It's question number 21 from the handout, and it says if, if the patient comes from an extended care facility to a hospital for same-day surgery or x-ray, and then sent back to the ECF, the patient is not admitted as an inpatient, or is the hospital required to send the, complete the UTF when the resident returns to the ECF? The answer to the question is yes. If it's not in the FAQ document, we're going to have to fix that. Yeah. The answer to the question is yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we do. Is somebody trying to ask a question on the line? Um, I'll continue on with um, a question from the chat. Um, this is from Joseph Friedman, who's noting that he is still unclear about sending dialysis three days a week. Uh, 
again, if, if you're a sending facility, you're not required to send, you're required to send the form the first time when you're making arrangements for dialysis to be received. And then you would send the form again if the resident or patient has a change in condition uh, that's important to the dialysis facility they should be aware of. You're not required to send the form on a, on a routine basis if this is a service they're receiving three times a week. Thank you. Stacey, do we have additional phone line questions? Yes, ma'am, we do. Our next question comes from Janet Bedoya with St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center. Please go ahead. Hello? Please go ahead, Janet. Your line is live. I had a question I put on the chat. Um, it's just we were told when the form was implemented that we had to do two separate forms for the patients going to dialysis and the and if that same patient was going back to a nursing home or a rehab. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We will take another question from the chat now. This is from Grizel. As a follow-up to the maternity question in transferring babies, does the same apply to high-risk pregnant mothers? We were told they could use the South Jersey perinatal collaborative form instead. Is that correct? Uh, there, were, there were waivers requested for South Jersey. The hospital each uh, would, would have received an individual copy of the waiver um, letter from the consortium. As long as you're using the current form that was provided as addressed in the waiver letter, uh, the UTF was not required for members of the consortium transferring within the consortium. Thank you. Um, we have had several individuals um, ask questions, um, and we'd like to share the uh, complaint number. Um, we will also email it out just so everybody has it, um, but the number is 1-800-792-9400. Again, the complaint number from the Department of Health is 1-800-792-9770. At this time, I think I'll take another question from the chat. Um, the question is from Joanne Doremi. I want to know what are the differences between the form that we are currently using and this new one? Uh, they're, 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 this is the same form you should be using. This, the form hasn't been amended at all since it was originally adopted. Um, Stacy, if we could take one more question from the phone line and then we will begin to wrap up. Yes, ma'am. Our final question from the phone will come from Peggy with Care One. Please go ahead. Peggy, your line is live. Please go ahead. Stacey, is there another final question for the public? Yes, I'm sorry. Lee Bailey with Jersey City Medical Center. Please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted a clarification on those transfers coming from the extended care. I understand needing to do the transfer form for same-day surgery, or, um, but I just wanted to clarify, if, if a patient is coming over for an x-ray or an EKG or anything like that, are you saying that this form needs to be filled out? Yes, if they're going from an extended care facility to another licensed facility, you would be sending the form with the uh, resident. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we will begin wrapping up the um, presentations. I first want to thank all of our presenters and speakers here for today from the New Jersey Hospital Association, Dan Moles um, as our consultant, as well as our colleagues from the Department of Health, and Deb Hunter from Greenwood House. Um, I hope that this has been an informative session for all participants. 
I do recognize that we have not been able to address all the questions. We have received quite a number via chat and the phone lines. We have collected all the chat questions and we will address them and um, send out email answers to the participants on this call. Um, if you do have further questions, we do encourage that you do reach out to the individuals as listed on the um, presenter contact sheet. Um, and we will be posting um, the materials from this call on the HQSI website. Um, that will include the PowerPoint presentation and so forth. Um, once again, I thank everybody for attending. I hope that this was an informative webinar. And um, please do stay safe and dry out there as it seems to be getting more and more windy here in East Brunswick. Thank you for attending. And at this point, this concludes the webinar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes your call. You may all disconnect.